All right, Adam Hale here, Insurance Man Podcast Don't Shoot. We got a very special episode today with Araceli. Thank you for, for joining us. Araceli's actually been a part of our office. She's our assistant manager and has worked with Taylor Legacy for 10 years this past December. Araceli, tell us a little bit about you and your family and that kind of thing. I've been in Churchilla for a number of years now. Okay. I was a stay-at-home mom before hearing of the opportunity to work at the office. I think I may have put together a resume in the Target parking lot. Came in for an interview, started working with the office ever since. I'm married, have three wonderful children, and my husband was home from being in the service for a for a 12 year term. Wow. And we really needed another income. And so yeah. that's when I learned about this position. Again, put my resume together, came in, and I love it here. It's conveniently down the street from my home. And you guys are stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're a huge, huge asset to our team. So you said you have kids. How, how many kids and how old? Um, so I have three kids. So I have okay. one just graduated high school. I have my second one, my son, who is going to be a senior in August. He plans to go into the military. So we'll see where that takes us. And then my youngest one is in eighth grade. She'll be a freshman coming up. And so all my kids are grown up. Oh, so. that's crazy. I remember when you first started, like, all of them being so young. And yeah. to think of like all of our kids are growing up. You know what I mean? It's scary, but yeah. it's life. How did you find us? Do you remember? I had a sibling working for the office and she calls me, hey, they're hiring. I think you would be great for this. Do you want to come in? Yeah. And so it was God sent, really. Yeah. And we scored for sure. Your role is running policy retention, a huge thing in insurance. And uh, there's always a bunch of chatter about Lincoln Heritage. We're not we're not the absolute cheapest. I've always told people yes. you, a lot of times you get what you pay for, right? Exactly. If you want a, a great program and to offers that everything that we offer, it's not going to be as cheap, right? To provide those services, you've got to be able to, to the company's got to be able to invest money to do those things. But um, a lot of chatter out there of people saying, oh, we replace Lincoln every time we come across it and things like that. And again, 15 years of doing this, I've never had an issue with persistence. A huge part of that, like for all of our agents is having what you do in our office. You save you. a ton of business. And we'll get into those numbers here in a little bit, but talk a little bit about persistency, like what that is. And so if maybe if there's a new agent or someone that's not licensed, what that means specifically. Persistency accounts for all of the policies that remain on the, this is both a number of policies along with a premium. Again, that remains on the books once written. And our company will gauge these numbers after the agent has been with us for a year. Okay. And then everybody starts at 100% and then it starts depleting from there, depending on what falls off the books. <laughs> and the old saying that I've always heard in I tell agents is the business that stays is the business that pays, right? So you mm -hmm. want to write good quality business Absolutely. to maintain, maintain good persistency. Retention is such an important part of our business because if an agent doesn't have good persistency, that's usually an indicator that they're doing something usually unethical, something they're not supposed to be doing. There's something going on. Exactly. We always want to look out for anyone who is losing business. We need to find out why is there patterns that we're coming across, potentially the lack of phone numbers, bad accounts. Are they overselling to our clients? And it's important to keep the best interest of the policyholder in mind. At the end of the day, it doesn't do anybody any good, right? It doesn't exactly. help the agents. A lot of times people will try and cheat. Not always are they cheating, but there are agents that will cheat the system to get the advanced commission. And persistency is one of the areas where we usually can see those things, or I know that you typically catch it pretty quickly as far as those patterns. With persistency, what is like maybe some advice that you would give to a new agent or someone that's just starting out? What would be some kind of some pointers and things retention wise? Definitely adding phone numbers. Okay. Definitely more is more. So for example, you write a policy, you go out there, you work hard, you help a family. And as time passes, if you don't add enough contact numbers, yeah. then there is no way for us to reach out and keep our policyholders long term. And so definitely more is more when it comes to phone numbers Add as many as you can, because on the back end, it is crucial in order for us to follow up. That way we don't rely on letters. Is it something that whenever you're going through there, you mentioned patterns, typically, what do you see if you if there's no phone number or a bad phone number? What? What does that generally assign if you see like that pattern? Typically, it will mean that they want to avoid the policyholder from having contact with, with the office or if there's no phone verification without a phone number. Or if there's a replacement after the fact and if there is no phone number, we can't reach out or talk about it and figure out why 
they may no longer be with us. If you're getting a lot of bad phone numbers or no phone numbers, mm -hmm. that's telling you probably there's something going on there, red flag. Exactly. Now at this time and in age, everybody has a phone number and then there is no good reason why you shouldn't disclose as much information as possible because then you generate referrals this way too. 100%. You know, word of mouth and that sort of thing. You guys track all the business that you redate and you guys go in and you guys reduce policies, do reinstate policies, mm -hmm. things of that nature. And looking at 2020, you saved over half a million dollars in business, 585,000, which is absolutely phenomenal. That was for the year 2020. It has a massive impact on our agency as a whole because I know at the end of 2020, when I looked at retention as a whole, our agency was at 88%. And without doing what you do, we wouldn't be anywhere close to that number. So thank you for that. Of course. And then we, looking at 2021, you did 677,000, 140 redated policies, a 16% growth. 2022, 856,000, absolutely phenomenal, 26% growth. And you're pacing 16% growth this year again as well. Yes, I'm hoping to... Get hit that a million. million. Get yeah. that million. You got it. And a standout thing, uh, December 2022, I know you guys were finishing out for a contest and $118,340, 118 grand. Yes. How did you do it? That's such a huge oh. amount of business. Well, I think follow up is crucial. I think definitely that was a really exciting time, exciting month too, especially with holidays. It's a little harder to get policyholders on the phone and make that sacrifice to make that additional payment or return those forms. Follow up is definitely crucial. You have to just keep carrying on. So for someone, let's say that, that there's an agency out there, whether they work with Lincoln Heritage or just in the insurance business in general, if they wanted to start their own retention department, what would that look like to you? Because we recently brought Michelle in that you, yes. you trained and, and she's been picking it up and saving more and more business. What does that process look like and how would you lay that out for someone that's wanting to design a retention department? Definitely, you have to have really good training as far as having access to the list of your policy holders, the reasons why they are no longer with us, being able to follow the guidelines to be able to reinstate the policies, offer options. If someone's looking to hire someone, what personality type of traits? Okay. Tell me about you because you're the- Someone just like me. No, <laughs> well, that's what we're looking to um, hire. Really. Exactly. Well, definitely you have to have people skills, good phone etiquette. I mean, you do need someone empathetic. You do want someone to find a plan or accommodate the needs of our policyholders. I think keeping their best interests in mind is super important. Okay. Overall, putting yourself in a position where you can understand what they need and just prioritize that to be able to assist them with whatever they can afford. Yeah, it's something to me that stands out about you as well is Araceli's super, super organized. Don't look at my desk, it's awful. <laughs> that comes out through your work and through your numbers is that it, you put systems in place and you've built, it looks like some things of how to run your day to day, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be hitting the numbers and the growth that you're currently hitting. So what does it like a normal day look like? Let's say like for yourself. All right, so let's see, we'll come in, log into all of our emails, check your emails, check your voicemails, and pending, immediately check on it to see if whether it's cleared or if it needs further attention. Okay. After that, definitely check your list of your to-do list on who you are to call. I think following up also in a timely manner and on time, like if you told Mrs. Jones, I'm gonna call you Friday the 17th at three, do call at Mrs. Three. Jones at three. They yeah. love that they can, that they feel important, that you are taking your time of day to follow up when you said you were. They okay. appreciate that and it just builds a long-term relationship with, with each individual client. How many times will you call if you get someone that's lapsed? How many times will you attempt to try and contact them? Let's see, definitely twice. If I call literally like today, I'll just call one person, they don't answer. I'll disconnect and then re-attempt, especially because everyone's, yes, definitely double dial every single time. Leave a voicemail. What do you generally say? What's a typical voicemail for her? I'll say something in the context of, good afternoon, this message is for Mrs. Jones. This is Araceli calling from Golden Memorial with Lincoln Heritage in reference to your policy. I can please have you give me a call back at your earliest convenience. Perfect. And have a great day or have a great weekend or that sort of thing at closing. So phone etiquette is very important then. As well. right. So for You the want to be pleasant. You want to be, we're there to help. And so I hope that it, we're able to translate that. Yeah, hundred percent. The empathy, like you said, is so, that's so important, right? To have a heart that really cares. And I know like for you, you're all in on customer I, service. I and feel like it's so. like I'm bragging if I say someone empathetic. I don't mean it to sound that way, but it's important. Let's say you've reached out to them. I see that you send out a lot of letters. What else do you guys do to try and save um, them? So for instance, if a policy is lapsed, just an example, I don't reach them on the phone. Um, 
And even if I did, just depending on what's required to reinstate them, I'll send out a letter notifying them of what is due, send the appropriate forms to reinstate, whether it's a reinstatement form to update payment information. We just want to make sure that letter that's included, um, it, it includes all of the forms required to tackle everything and address it all at once. Perfect, perfect. So you're not making them jump through a bunch of hoops, right? Exactly. Make it as easy as possible yes, to be able to absolutely. reinstate the business. For a new agent, because this is something that we've always trained on and we talk about, and anytime we do trainings here in the office, again, I like to have you involved. And when it comes to retention, a big, vast majority of it, or at least what I've seen in my career, is that if the agents will pay attention to their own reporting, if you get a lapse notice mm -hmm. or NTO, which is not taken out, so it didn't go through the, for the first payment, a lot of times with a simple phone call, you can mm -hmm. save that business. The client didn't know. Maybe they changed bank accounts or things happen. Are you hearing those things on the back end? Because I'm sure you get a lot of agents that are just completely ignoring the emails and things like that. Yeah, a lot of the times it's open the email and then to learn how to read these emails. Most, I, want, I don't want to say all, but most of the emails that come from our home office they're super detailed. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. It does let you know if something was insufficient funds or if something was moved to, say, direct billing. We need to find out why it was removed or follow up for payment. It's just you know, opening the reports and knowing how to read them as well is important. And you're more than welcome to call the office with questions. Perfect. Perfect. So any of our agents out there that are having issues with retention or that are new, definitely reach out to Araceli. I know she's Please. always more than willing to help out. And again, it's something that you work so hard to write these policies. You definitely want to do what you can to keep that business, right? The business that stays, the business that pays. Absolutely. And again, another thing is that there's no company out there that if you have really bad retention, they're not going to keep you. They're not going to keep you contracted. And we've seen, we've seen agents that have gotten terminated. Usually there's going to be some steps the company's going to take to try and correct the action of the agent. But if you don't, ultimately it, it could end in termination, which nobody wants that to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. We're definitely not in the business for catching anybody doing anything, but definitely make the corrections necessary. And yes, it is important to stay on top of your emails, building report with your customers, assisting them as much as you can, because our obligation, I'm, I'm a licensed agent myself, doesn't stop when we make a sale. It is thereafter as well with that continuing support, whether it's directly with our policyholders as an agent or referring them to our office for further assistance if you're really occupied. So yes, it's important to stay on top of everything to keep that persistency up. And a lot of times it's answering your phone, returning phone calls exactly. with the clients calling you. We see that off quite often as well. Yes. It's where it's like, you know, I've called my agent two or three times and they didn't call me back. And mm -hmm. I, I've seen agents lose business that they could have otherwise saved just by not not doing the right thing as an agent, taking care of that client. That's what we get paid for. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think if you're able to include the office number on your business card or just relay it to the policyholder, it will be immense help. We're able to help locally in several offices that Golden Memorial has. And so we're there to support our policyholders as much as we can. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's something that can almost seem daunting, especially agents that if you get behind on not following up your emails, if you have someone in your office or anybody working with Gold Memorial and with Taylor Legacy, reach out to the retention department, right? Because they're going to be there to help you. They're going to at least give you some guidance on some things that you can do to see an immediate difference in retention. And Lincoln's reports show that, right? Absolutely. And I know it can be overwhelming, especially if you are an agent who writes in high volume. Lincoln, I have to say, they are outstanding. You're notified of every change, whether something didn't go through, something got reissued, they're notifying us all the time. And then the agent has the opportunity to receive these firsthand and address them at that point while things are still fresh. In comparison to us at the office, we'll sometimes receive these a little bit later, really as an agent to have that advantage that you can follow up right away. And again, if it's like too much or you're unsure on how to go about it, just ask questions, call the office. <clears throat> Exactly, exactly. We want to, we want to help, right? Yes, absolutely. And a part of that too, you'd mentioned solidifying the sales process, right? If you're gathering all the information, you've worked hard to, to close the deal and help the family. You should also be letting them know of what the expectations are, right? So when I would sit with somebody, I'd, I'd let them know that, hey, you're going to get your FCGS paperwork. You're going to get your policies generally two to three weeks from the start date of the policy. You're going to have that. If you don't have it, here's my card. I'm your agent for life. I'd always tell them like if someone else, another agent comes to your house, so you get something in the mail, you have questions, call me, pick up the phone, call me. So I'm also coaching my client on the expectations and that, that way there's, if there's anything, and I can tell you I've had a ton of times where someone, someone would call me out of the blue and say, oh, I'm canceling that policy and I'd ask them why. And they say, XYZ company sent me a thing in the mail and I can get double the coverage for the same price. And I'd say, let's talk about that because Mrs. Jones, you understand the difference between term and whole life. Okay. And so just by educating them a little bit, and then by the time we hung up the phone, a lot of times only a few minute conversation, they would re-solidify that sale again 
they kept the policy. And again, by just giving them that card and spending a little bit of extra time after the sale, I was able to save that business. And I think that's really important for every agent should be doing that on what the expectations are in the process after they've made that policy sale. Yeah, absolutely. And then <laughs> just by taking time to answer that call, it just reassures them that you are indeed, just like you stated, their agent for life. They know that they can count on you. And that is really, you know, what we do. We're here to keep these policies on the books long term and it is necessary to be able to continue with that contact with each individual client when necessary or possible in order to do keep our word yeah um, in a sense yeah and i learned early on in my career and there's a guy if he's watching it jack dempsey shout out to him working with jack and getting a, to learn from him he always made a 98 99 percent persistency it's impressive it's phenomenal right yeah. and i think he's been in the industry for 20 plus years he's out in virginia always a plus business rating with better business bureau and I got an opportunity to go out there, visit his office. You walk in and it's the wall, this whole place just covered in plaques and trophies. And he's been on every trip, that kind of thing. And one thing that Jack, he really prided himself on was spending that extra time with the client, relaying that, hey, I'm your client for life. Here's my local office. You have an issue. And literally he had people bringing payments into the office that he wow. would send over to Lincoln. And But anytime someone wouldn't make a payment or there was, he'd get a notification, because he was so detailed in getting even the beneficiary's phone numbers, which you can also use as a referral, right? Yeah. Let the client know, obviously, but you can use it as a referral. He would call the beneficiaries. He told me he'd go as far as to call the beneficiaries and say, hey, you're, your mom missed your payment. Yes. It's only 40, 50 bucks a month. And because you're the primary beneficiary, I'm assuming if something happened, this is ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 that was going to you. We want to ensure that you're taken care of. Exactly. And he would say nine out of 10 times, he was like, I'd come and there'd be a check in my mail slot at the office that the beneficiaries dropped off. So beneficiary information, extremely important. And for that very reason, because a lot of the times if our policyholder or owner doesn't answer the line, I always reach out to the beneficiaries as well. And when there's no phone numbers, then it's, it makes our job that much harder. But yeah, absolutely. There, it's a great way to leave a message. If the main phone number for the policyholder is disconnected or unavailable, reach out and typically I'll, right then and there, I'll obtain a new phone number. I'll be able to update a phone number, obtain payment as well. At the very least, they can relate the message and then we can just at least continue to be in contact. And you'd listed in here too, when I was looking at the notes um, about double checking like the payment information, because think about how crazy that is. You spend 45 yeah. minutes, an hour, you maybe have driven an hour to get there. Yes. And think if you get one digit off and then you get a charge back, you know? Exactly. And it happens pretty often. A lot of the times if they don't have their bank statement on hand or they just read you the information, just double check it. You're already there. You already spent time. You're helping them out. You're helping them by helping yourself too, by double checking this information to ensure that these payments go through successfully. Awesome, awesome. Let's talk a little bit about the return of initial premium, underwriting memos, two weeks past due, things of that nature. If you can touch base on what each one of those are and how an agent should be utilizing those. Yeah, absolutely. So these will be some of the reports that they'll receive from the home office. Again, they'll receive notifications on two weeks past due. So anytime that someone will have a payment to return, the agent is notified. And then that's a good time to come in and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, I see that your payment returned. Is there, you know, everything okay? Can we reschedule that? If at this point, the premium may be a little high, you can offer reduction, et cetera, just depending on what their needs may be. Sometimes it was just a matter of drafting in the funds not yet being there and it's just reauthorizing that payment okay. to ensure that they stay current. And let's say the client doesn't have the money or says, I can't afford it. What do you typically tell them? I always want to make sure that the monthly premium is still comfortable for them. If it isn't, we can discuss reduce, but if it was just a matter of not being able to make the payment at that particular month, and if the bill date doesn't need to be changed, then we can always just double up the month after that to bring the policy current. So we'll just review options to make it up. Um, so bring it up to date. So you're basically asking them questions. Yeah. You're gathering information of to see course. what's going to be best for the client. What do you recommend if an agent, if they're unclear on if they should rewrite a policy or redate, what's the best course of action? That's a really good question. Anytime that a policy lapses, we do have a time frame in which we can reinstate to the policy. Just there's guidelines that we can always send via email in order to assist you. What is that for any Lincoln agents that are watching? So for example, if a policy, we have to determine whether they are eligible to be reinstated. Um, by completing uh, the form that we have access to online, both the customers and us as agents. And it'll tell them when they fill that out? It doesn't have all of the guidelines that ask if, well, if they are eligible to reinstate, it won't let you know X person is eligible. 
but it will provide you information on how to complete the form. Okay. I'll have the number of questions listed. It's really a simple health questionnaire. If you, anyone receives an email and they're unsure, they can always follow up at the office just to confirm whether they are eligible for a reinstatement, meaning they complete the form and pay all past due premiums, or if they have the option to redate, which is essentially completing the same form and returning with only one month's premium Okay. to bring the policy current at that point. What would be like some scenarios that you see that someone is eligible for multiple m months or some things that maybe knock them out from that? Let's say, because you said that if they paid, let's say two, two or three months with a with a- So all of our policies, when they lapse, they are eligible to reinstate and say that they are at that point for whatever reason, say three months past due. Okay. So they do have the option to reinstate it, paying the three past due premiums that are due at that point. Um, the policy can be redated once in the life of the policy. Okay. And so once that option is utilized, then we just then have to gone. stay on top of it and make sure that it doesn't lapse again, because if it does, then at that point we have to do a full reinstatement. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then is there ever an opportunity or a time where it's better for the agent to just rewrite the policy? Yeah, definitely. I had, as a matter of fact, today, a customer who I've been diligently following up with for a number of months now. Unfortunately, the policies that she was attempting to reinstate are 15 months past due. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's been a little, just a little just bit of time. Just a little bit, because we yeah. have up to 12 months and about 15 months past due. And I was like, you know what, unless you can do at this point, the three, at this point, it would be three months because a redate option with one payment is gone after that 12 month, then I would advise to rewrite the policy. Rewrite the policy, okay. Right, since the premium would be too high. <clears throat> this comes up every now and then, especially because the market is so competitive. You will see people that lapse and agents will sometimes get leads. Let's say someone that they had a policy, maybe it was six months ago, it lapsed, another agent, maybe their former agent wasn't even here, or maybe they just see one of our online advertisements. Mm -hmm. And then so the, another agent gets this, this lead, they go out to the house, they sell the policy, and then the company, in that instance, they're not going to advance some commission. And the reason that they do that is because if there's bad history on any of the business, that's usually a telltale or it's more likely over tons and tons of policies that the company's analyzed and written right. over the last 60 plus years. They're doing that as a way to protect the agent. If you're not getting that advance, again, some of those times you don't know. A lot of times the client's not going to tell you, oh, I had a Lincoln policy. Yeah. Unfortunately, and, they don't. Yeah. And so if you don't get advanced, you know, call in. They're great at telling you the explanation, but just understand it's designed to protect you, right? Because again, if it's lapsed, and a lot of times I, I had a handful of people I can remember that literally I would get the lead right on three months later, I get another lead and it's come on, you either got to yeah. keep this or you're just yeah. wasting money. You know what I mean? It's yeah. wasting my time as well, but, but that, that, there's a reason that they do that. So anybody that, if you do run into that, just keep that in mind. So what, like, what is the typical process in offering a reduction or a reinstatement? What does that look like for you when you're talking to a client? Being able to offer a policyholder different options. A lot of the times, say they have a, I don't know, $75 payment, for instance, they can no longer afford it. A lot of the times, unfortunately, they will just call in and I can't afford this policy request cancellation. Um, we want to make sure that they are aware that we can go ahead and reduce this coverage and in turn this premium in order to accommodate something more comfortable. It's not just all or nothing. We can always reduce whether it be the face of value, accidental death and dismemberment coverage, just we need to make them aware that there are options available so that we can conserve their business. It looked like about 2 million since 2020 that you've reinstated, a phenomenal number. Thank you. What would you attest the key things that you were doing that you're doing now that you weren't doing a few years ago that have helped you hit those huge increases in policy retention? You know what? Honestly, it's taking a little bit more time on the phone, I think, um, has really helped me. I know that sometimes just building that connection over the phone can be a little bit tougher naturally than doing it in person. But I think it's important to just take your time. I take notes on every single policy that I work on. I have notes going way back, like five, seven years. And I think keeping just good notes overall. So say I talked to Mrs. Jones and I remember from three years ago, she had a stroke. Just, oh, how are you doing everything? How's your heart, Mrs. Jones? Three years later, they value that and appreciate that. Yeah, and definitely. they are more willing or more likely, let me take the time to review options about if I'm having a hard time. And so I think just taking good notes has really helped me improve. Following up in a timely manner. Sometimes when we get 100, 200 policies that per week, it can be difficult. But definitely just keeping notes, setting up to-do lists, following up, and just being diligent has helped me just with organization and having better results.
That's impressive. Several <laughs> years back, that's super impressive. I try. Let's talk about seeing these patterns or if I'm questioning something, I'll come to you and say, hey, I really I need you guys to watch this business and see if you notice anything. And majority of the times you guys catch it way before I do or before their managers do. Any that you can recall or certain things that kind of stand out? Let's see, I don't have anything too bad. I think just when we see invalid account numbers, yeah, it's just the worst one. I haven't come across anything too, too bad or too scary, but just the bad accounts probably. It's a pretty big sign whenever they write a policy, it's super large and there is no valid account to draft from or no valid phone number, so. And I had a conversation with a gentleman that was a broker and he was telling me he went ahead and took a job. And the reason he took a job was is as a manager, when you earn an override, you're responsible for the agents for all the advanced debt and any, they call it, we call it runoff debt because Jared always telling me people, they run away with your money. Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, like the conversation I was having with this gentleman is it pushed him out of the business as a broker because he had several in individual agents that were basically doing fraudulent activity, right? They were making up account numbers, doing things to get advanced from the company. And because the company didn't have a retention department, I can tell you like my biggest runoff debt is I had one agent that cost me, I believe it was either 92,000 or 96,000. He went back and replaced a bunch of business he'd been advanced on, which is you're not supposed to do. You're definitely not supposed yeah, to do. not replace anything. <clears throat> We're the best ones out there. You don't need to replace it with anything else. And after that, and since we've implemented the retention department, it's very rare because he asked me, he goes, are you seeing agents hit you with a forty, fifty thousand dollar debt because he goes, that's really kind of it pushed me out of the independent world. And I told him, I said, because we have a retention apartment, a lot of times we'll catch those things. You guys will catch it. It might go on two or three months. And I think the last one, we had an agent that was manipulating a bonus structure that we have. You guys caught it. And then when we talked to Lincoln, they said, we're actually, we're investigating it as well. The agent only been here three months, but I think maybe it cost me seven grand or something like that. It wasn't such a significant amount of money. What would you advise for someone maybe that doesn't have the same support or have someone that's working on their pulse retention? What are like some main tips an agent can start doing and things that they can start doing to start improving their persistency. Definitely following up on any notifications that you do receive from the company in order to be able to address those issues in a timely manner. I always like to think of retention as a preventative measure. Like I don't want to wait till a policy lapsed to attempt to reinstate it. Yeah. I want to catch it whenever it's fallen a month behind and let me work on here and let me bring it current. Let me do take the steps that I need to take to prevent it from lapsing in the first place because then you'll you can come across other issues it's not just a matter of whether or not they'll reinstate it's are they eligible to reinstate the policy or are they now guide you things can change and we want to avoid running that risk at all costs yeah so basically like in my advice i was a bulldog as a salesperson i'm yes tara i'm terrible like with uh, organization I'm all over the place and so for me what helped me i was like Always 86, 87% retention. So it wasn't terrible. It's good. It's Pretty good. good. And I had two philosophies. Number one was it was like anytime a policy took the stance that production is a cure all. And so I was like, I've now I've got to write two more policies just to replace that one. But another it's, thing it's that. It's a band aid. <laughs> yeah. And, but the second was is that in order to be able to do it and, and actually keep up with it, because again, my sole focus was so much on production, was I made a, a habit of anytime I would get the email, because again, a lot of times I was on the road, I'm calling them right then and there. I'm going to make at least one or two attempts. I'm going to leave a message. I'm going to do the same thing because if I didn't do it right then and there, when I got the email, 99% of the time it got lost in the shuffle. I forgot about it. Yes. And it, you're giving away a lot of money by doing that, by not following up that business. So I think that for any agents out there yeah. that is just immediately right. When you get it, call them right then and there, do it. What, you know, that way it's not out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Once you open that email, unless you're going to put it back to unopened or unread, just get it done. If you can Yeah. reach out while you know, the issue has occurred and then find ways to assess, find ways to just bring a current or reinstate it if need be. So yeah, following up in a timely manner, extremely important. And that's another thing too, is that, or if you're in the area, if you have the time or you have a break in your schedule, stop by and see them, if, especially for the our outside salespeople. I think it's crucial, especially like on telesales. We talked about the solidifying the sale. Obviously, if you built rapport, you've done all these things, you want to make sure you solidify the process. Take the extra time, the personal touches of what you're doing, I think are fantastic. And But set a schedule. The people and the agents that I've seen that are successful and that have maintained 
good retention. There's consistency to what they're doing. And so that means if you carve out an hour or two a week to do, I'm just going to call through all my underwriting memos. I'm going to call through all my lapses or NTOs, spend the time to do it because it is, it's money making activity. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. This goes with a long hand with renewals, with your referrals, and it's just paying attention to any issues that have arised, just like you were there making a sale, being able to provide that attention after the sale, I feel like it's even more important in order to conserve that business and to be able to provide that support, which I feel like Lincoln Heritage is very proud of to provide that support for policyholders and their families. Yeah. And if, if you're not doing it, especially for agents that are, if you're writing, in my opinion, under probably I'd say 10,000 a month or less, I would recommend hand delivering every policy. If you're someone that writes 25, 30,000 a month, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. It could be a challenge. Absolutely. <laughs> but you're writing five, five, 10, or maybe you're part-time for the outside salespeople. I'd recommend delivering those, filling out the FCGS paperwork, right? So you're delivering, make sure the clients are actually taking advantage of all the benefits of our program, re-solidifying that process. And it's also, it's a perfect opportunity to pick up referrals as well. Yeah, definitely. I think once they are, once they're happy with the service that you've provided, they, they love being able to share that with loved ones, with family members and it's a nice way to make help others and make some more money. Yeah, nothing wrong with more money. What about an agents that are in trouble with retention? What steps should they take? Whenever an, an agent has an issue with retention, they'll obviously notify them. Uh, they'll usually give them a warning or two depending on how low the retention is. I, our company standard is they like to see everybody at 80% or higher. Mm -hmm. I know like for telesales as a trend, I've seen tele telesales as it's grown is a little bit lower. I think we're right, right about 75%. So. Meaning if you're on the phones, you're going to have to spend that extra time. You should be really carving out some time, taking your time, doing all the things we talked about to ensure that you have good retention and make sure that you're not overcharging, that you're not giving people too big a policy. I'm sure you see that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you are making a sale in person. You can gauge the comfort. You can read their body language and gauge how comfortable they are with each a proposed amount. I think over the phone, it's clearly, it's a challenge to be able to gauge that information. You don't have a lot to go by. Someone can easily say, oh yeah, $200 a month, that's comfortable. Here's my bank account number. And then it's incorrect because yeah. they can't afford it. So yeah, definitely not overselling. Keep in mind, you can always start something a little smaller, solid, add always. soon after. There is no policy fee for any additional coverage within the year. You can always add. Yeah, and definitely if they're going between, <laughs> let's say a hundred bucks and 80 bucks, give them the 80 bucks, yeah, never push them. Absolutely. There's a lot of sales careers out there that they want you to upsell and final expense. I've always trained the opposite, right? Again, you want to find that perfect payment that you know they can keep and that they're comfortable in and get them to buy in on that. Cause again, if sometimes like you said, we'll tell you one thing and then they go back or after you leave and then you get that immediate call or that yeah. email from Lincoln that they canceled yeah. or the NTO happened. Yeah, absolutely. Or just simple things like, oh, I changed my mind or again, the account is incorrect or just the number of reasons it could be endless, but definitely sometimes even just a twenty ten dollar nudge can make all the difference. And finding something comfortable, not overselling, is very important. And a thing that I've seen a lot too is those bigger policies. I see them people posting them. We we track all of our numbers, and anytime it's over a hundred, it makes me nervous. Right? Our, we're dealing with a middle to lower income, primarily mainly lower income yeah. seniors that are living on social security and $200 a month, a lot of times it's not feasible for someone if they're living on a very tight income. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm not upselling on the AD and D sometimes it's also important. They absolutely don't need it. And then yes, keeping in mind their age group. I mean, it should be common sense. I don't want to yeah. <laughs> sound insulting to anybody, but yeah, keep that in mind. Again, us agents be in their best lookout and write business in, in their best interest and reminder every day. Yeah. And we have, please. so we have another thing too, that comes up an $800 advance, a max household, right? If it's tied by the same checking account, they live in the same house, or if let's say a husband and wife are getting it. Anytime those are, there's a, a connection between policies, they're going to limit your advance. And a lot of people view that as a negative thing or yeah. agents that don't know any better. And obviously being around the business a long time, I've heard the horror stories and I've had friends that work for other companies and they're like, oh, I got a $3,000 advance. Oh, I got a $2,000 advance and then everything's great. And then six, seven months down the road. If they make it that far. If they make it that long, yeah. <laughs> and then it's, oh, I didn't get paid anything because I owe the company 5,000 or yeah. $6,000 in chargebacks. And that's another great thing about Lincoln is, is that if it's something that's denied in the first two years during the contestability period, they're never gonna take more than half your check. The great thing about the London family when they built this is they understood that we need to be able to put gas money in our car. We gotta be able to pay our bills. If you're selling over the phone, you gotta be able to pay anything that's associated with that. And so every time you sell something, you're gonna get paid. But they put these protections in place, again, not getting that 100% charge back and then 
limiting your advance amount so that you're not getting crushed in chargebacks because yeah. I've seen it put people out of business. Absolutely. Not because, you know, we work for Lincoln, but they have a great support system in place um, limiting these maximum advances. It's definitely a safety net for our agents and you have to look at it positively. Yeah. It's, well, it's done for a reason. Yeah. It's, they know what they're doing. They're not doing it based on a couple of policies. They're doing it on yeah. 60 years of yeah. being the leader in final expense. Let's say I'm an agent. I've been here seven, eight, nine months, whatever, or maybe even longer. And all of a sudden I get a notice that they're lowering my advance, right? Cause again, Lincoln will send a letter letting them know if there's an issue, if it's really low, like a lot of times if it's under 75%, they'll start reducing their advance commission because again, has a way to protect the agent, right? They're exactly. an advance is money that hasn't, they're advancing you on something that hasn't been paid yet yeah, by the client. Good faith. Yeah. And so they'll do that as a way to protect you. But I'm that agent, I get that letter, I get my commission reduction, whatever it may be. What can I do or what steps would you advise me as an agent that you think could make an immediate difference? I would definitely just reach out for that support to have a helping hand to work on these as well, to follow up, send out the appropriate forms and have that support with reinstatement because it is available. Like, why would you not leverage it? Yeah, hundred percent. And, it, and if form. you're calling the agent because you need a signature mm -hmm. or maybe you need like, them to stop by, yeah. pick up the phone. They're yeah, trying no, to save absolutely. you some money. Definitely pick up the phone, respond to your emails that you do receive. It's not there to get you in trouble. We're just there to help. And if you are encountering this issue where they have reduced your advance, definitely reach out for support. We're a team and help me help you. Yeah. Really, it's what it is. And anytime we've had an agent and it doesn't happen too often, we have an agent getting account trouble. It's generally because, again, there's something, maybe they're not even intentionally doing it, but there's there's something going on, right? We have to make a decision. Let's start with number one, what's their average premium size, right? Because if they're writing these huge apps, we already know, again, you start getting over that $100 a month consistently, yeah. you're gonna have retention issues, it, almost guaranteed. Absolutely. Those are the first ones to unfortunately lapse, whether it's insufficient funds or just simply can't afford it. And as a preventative measure, I would say reduce before they lapse, but if they have lapsed, then we can always reduce and reinstate it at that point. But definitely it's hard to do it as an agent alone. So if you're unsure, call your office, call your manager. There's options available. We can send the guidelines on educating you on how to do this. And if we can help by requesting the forms or following up, once we have those forms in the office, we can also follow up with making sure that these get worked on and processed in a timely manner. We're there to support you through the entire process. That's awesome. And another thing too that an agent can do, at least with our company, is making sure that you're taking enough time or really explaining the benefits of what the FCGS, Guardian Society, what they do, right? Jacqueline was very intelligent. What a great service it was for our clients. Implemented it and now we offer that as a free, it's a free part of our program. Absolutely. Believe it or not, I've seen agents and we, you know, we have a very thorough training process, but I've seen people go out there and not even mention it. And it's, this is gonna help your policy retention by yeah. getting people to buy in that and really take full advantage of the program. So taking that extra time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for the company, the FCGS is like our bread and butter. People love learning about the benefits. I'm um, knowing that they are available 24 seven. They like to have that support. And why would we not mention it? We have to. Yeah, I think the last figure I seen, it was like over $6 million that they saved. That's $6 million or not for profit money that went to the family instead of the funeral homes. And having the 24 hour payout by Lincoln, having the FCGS to help the family. I've had a handful of family members over the years pass away. Mm -hmm. And even just recently, it was involved in the process. And to see them, I think they got a quote originally for $4,000 and they were able to do a direct cremation for about 900 bucks. They found a funeral home right up the road. That's impressive. Having them share the value of the FCGS, it's extremely important. Definitely one of our selling points. We utilize that benefit when retaining the business. No one else offers it. And policyholders love to be reminded of that. They need to be reminded of the FCGS, knowing that they're going to be there to support their families at such a hard time to ensure that they don't overpay. Once they're dealing already with such a great loss, the last thing that you want them to deal with is that financial cost. Most people are deer in headlights when it happens. I've talked to a handful of people, even family members, and it's they're on cruise control, right? Like, I don't even remember this or I don't remember that. Yeah. And so having that, it's a yeah. huge thing for our clients. And it's also a great opportunity to leverage for referrals as well. Yeah, definitely a helping hand. We've had a handful of agents that have actually come aboard because of all the money that FCGS has saved for the families. And it's pretty cool what they do. I appreciate you staying late here and <laughs> coming on board. You're a phenomenal asset to our Thank team. You. Very, We're very blessed to have you. And again, we continue to, we, our goal is we want to continue to grow the retention department, right? You do a fantastic job. Thank you. Another 10 plus more years, hopefully. Willing, yes. Anything else that you want to 
end with. So I just want to remind our agents that we are in the business of helping families. We definitely want to make sure that we're able to provide our policyholders with a value-based policy and to remind them that it's extremely important to continue that support thereafter, whether it's as an agent towards our policyholders or by directing them to the office for additional help and support. That is what we're here for. And so we definitely want to pave the way to a long-term relationship and keeping these policies for as long as we can. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Thank you, (laughs) Araceli. I'm going to put Araceli's number, our office number down below. So any of our agents or if anybody would like to pick her brain. Email's great too if you're on the road and you can't be on the phone all the time. So 100%. I'll put that as well. For anybody that doesn't have a, a policy retention department, I would highly recommend it. It's good for your business. It's good for your clients. And it's good for your agents to show that we're supporting them and saving them that chargeback money as well. So thank you for everything, Araceli. You're very welcome.